You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. When people find out that I am into true crime, and likely when people find out that you are into true crime, there are generally two reactions that are the most prevalent. The first is happiness, because they have found someone else that is into learning about the dark and the macabre like ourselves. The second is that look that many of us know that recognizes us from that point on as a bit of a freak. True crime interests, intrigues, and enthralls many of us for many different reasons. Perhaps you love a good mystery, or perhaps you, like myself, are very interested in the psychology that encircles many of the cases that are out there for public consumption. There certainly are people who get too entrenched in the stories, and there are those that romanticize killers, criminals, and stories as well. We're going to look at one such case here on this episode. We're going to talk about a man who believed that he was sent a vision of the perfect woman for himself, and then was lucky enough to meet that woman. The lengths, though, that this man would go to in search of eternity with his true love were certainly different. To many, they were beyond acceptable and strange, but still to some others, they view this as a story about a man who was an eccentric romantic. Hello, my name is Lance, and welcome to episode 80 of Gone But Never Forgotten, Hopeless Romantic or Love Gone Too Far, the story of Carl Tanzler and Maria Hoyos. George Carl Tanzler was born on February 8th of 1877 in Dresden, Germany. He would spend his young life growing up in Imperial Germany, and he would eventually graduate there from a medical university. Carl then would make the decision to travel from India to Australia, with the intention of eventually continuing on to the South Seas Islands. The South Seas Islands were modern-day Malaysia, Thailand, Brunei, and Indonesia on Borneo. His stop in Australia was meant to only be for a short time, as he would stop there to collect equipment, boats, and to learn about the weather and sea conditions of the area. However, he would also become very interested in engineering and electrical work while he was in Australia, and would wind up purchasing property, boats, and an island in the Pacific Ocean. After 10 years on his small pit stop in Australia, he was still there. Finally, Carl had started to build himself a trans-ocean airplane when World War I broke out, and he was placed by British military officers into a concentration camp for what they called, quote, safe keeping. But most of us know how that went. He would eventually be placed in Trial Bay, which was a giant prison that was a lot like a castle. When the war came to an end, no prisoner in the camps was allowed to return to their former homes, and they were instead shipped to the Prisoners' Exchange, which was in Holland. When Carl was released from the exchange, he went off to find his mom, who he had not heard from since before the war had started. Thankfully, he would find her safe, and he stayed with her in Germany for three years, where he witnessed the horrible chaos and fallout that took place in the wake of Germany losing the war. 
His mother would eventually suggest to Carl that he leave Germany and that he move to the United States where his sister was already living. While back in Germany, however, around 1920, Carl would marry a woman named Doris Schaefer, and the two would have two children, Aisha Tanzler and Clarista Tanzler. Carl would emigrate to the United States in 1926, and he would do so by sailing from Rotterdam in the western part of the Netherlands on February 6, 1926, two days before his 49th birthday. His trip would have him land in Havana, Cuba, and from there he would settle in Zephyr Hills, Florida, which was where his sister was already living. Once Carl was settled, he would later be joined by his wife and his two daughters in Zephyr Hills. Not too long after they arrived, though, Carl would abandon his family in Zephyr Hills, and he would take a job as a radiologist at the U.S. Marine Hospital that was located in Key West, Florida. His name that he officially used for the job was Carl von Cassell and he had previously submitted for U.S. citizenship using the name Carl Tanzler von Cassell. The choice of name was because he had long told the story that he was a relative of Countess von Cassell, who was regarded as one of the most well-known women in Saxon history. Carl would even say that the Countess had visited him multiple times as he grew up. He even mentioned that she had at times given him visions of a beautiful, dark-haired woman that he believed was to become the love of his life. After working at the Marine Hospital for three years, Carl would come into contact with a woman named Maria Alina Malagro de Hoyos. She was a Cuban-American woman who was brought to the hospital by her mom for an examination because she was unwell. Carl knew immediately, once he saw Elena, that she was the beautiful dark-haired woman that he had seen in his visions. Elena was the daughter of a well-known cigar maker named Francisco Hoyos and Aurora Malagro. She also had two sisters. Elena would get married on February 18th of 1926 to a man named Louis Mesa. Sadly, their marriage would end shortly after Alina suffered a miscarriage. The two did not get an official divorce, however, but Louis would move away to Miami, leaving Alina behind. Upon Alina's visit to the hospital, she would be diagnosed with tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was a disease that was typically fatal at the time. It is a disease that is caused by germs that are spread from person to person through the air, and it generally affected the lungs, but could also affect the brain, the kidneys, or even the spine. Sadly, most of Alina's family would eventually succumb to tuberculosis. Carl, though, obviously wanted to do everything that he could to save young Alina's life. Carl believed that he had a lot of medical knowledge from his training and years in the medical field, even though he was not a doctor and he believed that he could treat and even cure Alina. Carl would use a variety of medicinal treatments, x-rays, and even electrical treatments. He would bring everything and anything that he could think of to the Hoyos home. While he was trying to treat her and defeat the tuberculosis, Carl would also shower Alina with gifts. He brought her clothing, he brought her jewelry, and he told her many times that he was in love with her. In 1930, Carl would be 53, and Alina would be 21. It's unknown to what degree Alina returned the affection and adoration to Carl that he doted upon her. Despite all of Carl's best efforts, however, Alina would succumb to tuberculosis at the family home in Key West on October 25th, 1931. Suffice to say, believing that Alina was to be the love of his life, Carl did not take well to that turn of events. He had lost a patient, and more importantly to him, he felt as though he had lost the battle to keep young Alina alive so that the two of them could have a happy life together. 
So inconsolable was Carl that he paid for the entire funeral, and he even convinced the family of Alina to build a crypt using his money. However, when the crypt was constructed, there was only one key ordered, and that was his own. Being the only person with constant access to the crypt of Alina, Carl would visit her every single day for two years. However, the visits would stop in 1933 when he was fired from his position at the Marine Hospital. The family was shocked that after years of doting over Alina while she was alive, and then visiting her crypt every day after she passed, Carl had suddenly stopped visiting the crypt. Seven years later, the reason that Carl had stopped visiting the crypt would come to light. One evening in April of 1933, not long after Carl had been fired from his job, Carl would quietly make his way through the cemetery where Alina's tomb was, and he would remove her body from the mausoleum. He did so by placing her body in a toy wagon and taking her from the cemetery and to his home. Carl would later say that every time that he visited Alina, her spirit would come to him, and she would often tell him to take her home, away from the cemetery. Carl would continue in his mind, as he had done in life, to take care of Alina. He would attach Alina's bones together with piano wire, and he even fitted her face with glass eyes to make her look alive. As her skin started to decompose, Carl would replace the skin with silk cloth that was soaked in wax and plaster of Paris. As Alina's hair fell out because of the decomposition of her scalp, Carl made a wig from her hair. He had also obtained hair after Alina's death from her mother. Carl would fill the corpse's abdominal cavity and chest cavity with rags, so that her body kept its original form, and he even spared no expense, dressing her in the finest of stockings, clothing, jewelry, and gloves. Alina's body would even be kept in his bed at all times. Carl would use perfume, disinfectants, and preserving chemicals to both mask the odor of the decomposition and to slow down the effects of the decomposition. The family, of course, did not have any idea of what was going on with Carl and Alina. They did not have a key to the mausoleum, and as such, they had no way of knowing that Alina was not still resting inside. In October of 1940, though, Alina's sister Florinda would start to hear rumors that were flying around. The rumors included the fact that Carl was sleeping with her sister's body at his home. Those rumors stemmed from many things that were noticed about Carl in the years between when he took Alina's body in in 1933 and 1940. People noticed that Carl would often be seen purchasing women's clothing and women's perfumes, even though it was believed that he lived alone and was single. Another story told of a young neighbor of Carl's seeing him dancing with what appeared to be a life-sized doll in front of an open window for the entire world to see. Florinda would come to Carl's house to confront him when these stories started to reach her and her family. Carl would willingly show Florinda the body of her dead sister. Florinda originally believed that the body that she was looking at was an effigy to Alina that Carl had made. She did not know at the time that it indeed was the corpse of her sister. When Florinda went to authorities, they would come and arrest and detain Carl. Carl would be psychiatrically examined, of course, to even see if he was mentally competent to stand trial. And he was found mentally competent. He was charged with wantonly and maliciously destroying a grave and removing a body without authorization. When the body was removed from Carl's home, that is when the autopsy would discover how Carl had pieced the body together, worked tirelessly to keep the body in the best condition possible, 
and most disturbingly, how he had made Elena's corpse capable of using for intercourse. Carl had inserted a paper tube inside of Elena's vagina so that he could do those acts with the woman that he reportedly loved. Even though that was done, most sources do still claim to this day that Carl never admitted to committing necrophilia, nor was there any actual evidence that there was any necrophilia that had taken place. Also of interest was the fact that Carl had built a laboratory in his home that resembled an airplane. Carl called the lab Alina's airship, and he seemed to believe that if he flew Alina's body high enough into the stratosphere, radiation from outer space would penetrate her tissues and restore life to her. A preliminary hearing in this case would happen on October 9th of 1940 at the Monroe County Courthouse in Key West. Carl was held to respond to the charges, but the case would eventually be dropped altogether and Carl was released. That was because the statute of limitations for the crime had passed. As you can imagine, news of this case spread far and wide, and as I said at the start of the episode, many people really started to romanticize the story and sympathize with Carl himself and his actions. Most people tended to view Carl with pity instead of the hatred that you may expect in a story that includes grave robbing and other crimes. People tended to view him as a lonely man who was a hopeless romantic and had lost a woman that he loved and fought hard to keep alive. With the charges dropped, Carl would obviously be allowed to continue on with his life. In 1944, he would move to Pasco County, which was close to Zephyr Hills. There he would write an autobiography in 1947. It's believed that he moved back close to Zephyr Hills so that he could be closer to his wife, Doris, who actually helped to support him in the later years of his life. Carl Tanzler would become a U.S. citizen in 1950 at the age of 73. Carl never did let Alina go, though. Carl would use a death mask to create a life-sized effigy of Alina that he lived with until he died at the age of 75 on July 3, 1952. He was found three weeks after he passed away in the arms of Alina's effigy. Over the years, there have been various parts of the story that have been changed or evolved over time, and many facts that are argued to this day. As you can imagine, in over half a century, things change over time, whether it's on purpose or by accident. One of those details is the detail of necrophilia. Some people say that there was evidence that Carl did have intercourse with Alina's corpse, while most contend that the, uh, that the narrative only changed in the 1970s because there was not any evidence at all that it had occurred. Carl's obituary said that he had died on the floor behind one of his organs, rather than reporting that he had died in the arms of the effigy. Others have even stated, though, that he had somehow arranged for Alina's body to be returned to him again, and that he had actually died in the arms of Alina's actual corpse. This is widely disagreed with because she was reburied in an unmarked and unknown grave after her corpse was returned to the cemetery. In 1982, a man told a story about Carl and stated that he found a note that Carl had written allegedly before his death in which he confessed to killing Alina by poisoning her. The ledger allegedly said, quote, she died because I gave this to her mercifully. I mixed the root of wolfsbane with aconite diluted. It was palatable, and my loved one departed this miserable world on October 25th, 1931. Suffer no more, sweet Alina. I have sent you to the angels with my golden elixir. Unquote. Carl's story has been told and retold on endless number of times in music, print, television, theater, and podcasts much like this one over the years, 
and you can see slight differences and opinions seeping through in most of those retellings. So, I ask you, how do you feel about this case? I will be posting about this episode and the case on social media, as I always do. So please feel free to comment and start the discussion on any platform about what you feel. Do you hear this story and feel pity for a man who believed that he had found and lost his soulmate? Or do you have disdain for a man who stole a body and lived with a corpse against the knowledge and wishes of her loved ones? Is this story all wrong to you? Or is it just sad? Please let me know. Comments and shares of posts help me so much here with the show and with spreading the word. If you cannot support the show by becoming a patron, the next best thing is helping to spread the word and increasing activity on our posts on all of our socials. So, that puts a wrap on episode 80. Here's two hundreds more. Please come back next week for another episode of Gone but never forgotten. Until then, I will bid you adieu, and I will of course ask all of you to be well and be better.